Hey guys, Mr. McMahon. Today we're going to talk about a new time period. Uh, basically just finished the Renaissance and today we're going to talk about the Reformation. The Reformation was a movement to reform or to make better the Catholic Church. And so we're going to go through some of the causes and some of the major events of the Reformation. Okay, the Reformation, also called Protestant Reformation, and the Counter-Reformation, also called the Catholic Reformation. These are Standard 662 and 663 from the Standard Course of Study for Social Studies in South Carolina. So here are our learning objectives. Uh, by the end of this lecture, I would like you to know the key figures of the Reformation in Catholic Reformation and what they contributed to it. What were the causes of both the Reformation and Catholic Reformation? or the major events of the Reformation in Catholic Reformation? And finally, what are some of the points of contention and denominational affiliations of nations during the Reformation in Catholic Reformation? So the Reformation, also called the Protestant Reformation. So if we look at the key words here, Protestant and Reformation, you see highlighted in Protestant is protest. So again, they're objecting to uh, some of the practices of the Catholic Church. Then let's look at the word reformation. You have the root word reform that is highlighted. To reform something is to change and make it better. So the object of the Protestant Reformation was to object to some of the practices of the Catholic Church and then to change the Catholic Church to make it better. So what caused the Reformation slash Protestant Reformation? So the four main causes of the Protestant Reformation or Reformation was that, number one, people felt like the priests and bishops weren't doing their job well enough. They weren't holy enough. They weren't religious enough. Two, they felt the Pope had too much power, especially in politics. They were a little concerned when the Pope can start something like the Crusades or leads a country like the Papal States. And they thought the Pope should stay just as a religious leader. Three, they thought the church was much too wealthy and that this wealth was corrupting people. Number four, which we're going to explain in a, more in a little mo in a moment, is the sale of indulgences. Uh, and we'll explain this more in the next slide. All four of these add up to causing the Reformation or Protestant Reformation. So let's look at what an indulgence is. An indulgence basically is a document. It's a document signed by the Pope that would forgive one for their sins, which would make it much easier to get into heaven. There are two ways that one can get an indulgence. You could do acts of good works for the, for the poor, etc. And the one they really have a problem with, you could buy an indulgence. And people felt like it was uh, morally wrong to buy a document from the Pope that would allow you to get into heaven. So indulgences were the large uh, or the big cause of the uh, Protestant Reformation. So Roman numeral three, what are some key figures of the Reformation slash Protestant Reformation? So the first key figure is Martin Luther. He is a Catholic priest, and he wants to reform or change the Catholic Church to make it better. So he writes 95 theses or 95 complaints, and many of these complaints are about indulgences, the documents that will allow someone to be forgiven of their sins and, and have an easier time getting into heaven. And these 95 theses end up causing the Reformation. So Martin Luther is giving credit for causing this large movement. So Martin Luther has some other points of contention besides indulgences. And again, a point of contention is something that you argue and it is something that you disagree with. So one of his points of contention is that in the Catholic Church, if an individual wants to be forgiven, forgiven for their sins, they go meet with a priest and then they are forgiven for their sins. Martin Luther said you don't need someone in between you and God. You can go directly to God and be forgiven for your sins. Another point of contention of Martin Luther was that in the Catholic Church, the Bible and the Pope lead the faith. As you remember, the Pope has a lot of power in the Catholic Church. Martin Luther would argue that only the Bible can lead the faith. Another point is that the Catholic Church, during the time of the Reformation, only wrote the Bible in Latin. So only those who could read Latin could read the Bible, and most people couldn't read Latin. Martin Luther took the Bible, and he thought he should translate the Bible in the people's language or their vernacular, German, English, French, etc. The final point of contention we're going to look at with Martin Luther was that 
in the Catholic Church, popes and priests during the time of the Reformation were very much involved in politics. Again, the pope is the one who asked for the Crusades. Martin Luther said that popes and priests should not be involved in politics and should just stick to being a religious leader. Now, Martin Luther, of course, does not stop. He continues to try to reform the Catholic Church, and the Pope excommunicates him. Now, excommunication was a big deal in the, during the Reformation. If one was excommunicated from the Church, they were afraid they would end up in hell. And so this was not something to be taken lightly. So when Martin Luther becomes excommunicated, we get the official start of the Protestant Reformation. So now we get two branches of Christianity in Europe. You get Roman Catholics, and you get Protestants, those who are in protest against the Catholic Church. And at this time, you get the Lutherans, who are the first set of Protestants. Now, you have some other Protestant Reformation leaders. So besides Martin Luther, we have John Calvin, Henry VIII, and John Knox. John Calvin, who is also a Protestant leader, teaches the idea of predestination. For it is predetermined before your birth whether you will go to heaven or hell. And so John Calvin is very much associated with the idea of predestination. John Calvin also teaches his followers to, to uh, practice God's laws and to reject Catholicism. So under John Calvin, you get what are called the Calvinists. You get some American Protestants eventually who are the Puritans, the Presbyterians, and the Huguenots who all follow the teachings of John Calvin. John Knox, he brings the teachings of John Calvin and the ideas of Presbyterianism, he brings it to Scotland. And our, finally, our final Protestant leader is King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII wanted to divorce his first wife. The Pope refuses to end the marriage. Henry VIII opposed him. Um, the Pope excommunicates him. So Henry VIII founds his own church, the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church. King Henry VIII becomes the head of the Church of England, and at this time, the king controlled all of the church land, which means Henry VIII got a lot of power. And so some of the denominational affiliations you'll now found, find in Europe. You get Christian, they're all Christians. You get two major branches, Catholics and Protestants. And under Protestants, you get Lutherans, the Church of England, Anglicans, Calvinists, and under Calvinists, you get a couple more branches, the Presbyterians in Scotland, and in the United States, you get the Puritans, Huguenots, and Presbyterians. Now, Johann Gutenberg is also a leader during the Reformation, but not for him. It's what he invented, which is the printing press. It allowed to spread the ideas of Martin Luther, and John Calvin, and John Knox, etc. It allowed those ideas to spread quickly because of the printing press, which has a direct cause of the Reformation. So what about the geography of the Reformation? So we get some denominational affiliations of the nations. In Northern Europe, we get Protestant countries. In the middle, in the German states or the Holy Roman Empire, we get a mixture of Catholic and Protestant. And in the Southern Europe, we get mainly countries that are going to be Catholic. So again, in Germany, which is the homes of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and John Knox, we get a mixture of Protestant and Catholic countries inside of the Central Europe, which is mainly uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which today we call Germany. Our Protestant countries are mainly located in Northern Europe. We got Sweden, Norway, Denmark, England, and the Netherlands. And in the southern part of Europe, we get Spain, France, Austria, Italy, and we also get Poland that will be Catholic countries. So why would you want to be Catholic or Protestant? Well, in Catholic country, the monarch's going to keep the power, and they basically they're going to side with the Pope. In a Protestant country, the monarch wants more power, so they become Protestant, and they weaken the Pope. So what, what's the reaction of the Catholic Church to the Protestant Reformation? So the first reaction of the Catholic Church is to stop the Reformation. So Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, declares war on any German state that went Protestant, because remember it's a mixture of Protestant states and Catholic states, so he declares war on the Protestant states. Unfortunately for him, the war is unsuccessful against the Protestant states. 
So there's a peace treaty, and we call it the Peace of Augsburg. And what the peace treaty says that inside the Holy Roman Empire, the German state, it's up to the individual leader of each German state to choose whether they want to be Catholic or Protestant. So if you have a Catholic king, you're going to be a Catholic nation. If you have a Protestant king, you're going to be a Protestant nation. And that's what the Peace of Augsburg is going to allow. Now, we get two terms because of the Peace of Augsburg. First of all, we get religious desertion, which means people left their country because if they were Catholic and they were in a Protestant country, they're going to leave to go somewhere to be Catholic or vice versa. The other group of people we get are called religious dissidents. These people decide to stay in their countries and disagree with the religion of their country or nation. So you might be Protestant and you might be in Spain and you might openly disagree with the way uh, that you're not allowed to practice your Protestant faith inside of Spain. And then we get what's called the Counter-Reformation. The Catholic Church decides, okay, let's change what we're doing. And they call together a, a meeting called the Council of Trent. It's created by the Pope, Pope Paul III. The first thing they do is they set up rules for clergy, rules for priests and bishops to follow. Second, they reject all the Protestant leaders' teachings of Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox. They begin seminaries, which are schools to train priests on how to, you know, be a very good priest. And the big one is they get rid of the selling of indulgences. So indulgences are no longer allowed. The Council of Trent also set up a new religious order of priests called Jesuits. The main, there's two main jobs of, of Jesuits. One of them is to become teachers and teach the Catholic faith to other people. And second is to be a missionary, which is to spread the faith or spread Christianity. Now, unfortunately, we do get uh, many conflicts between Catholics and Protestants during the Protestant Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. There's three we're going to look at, the Thirty Years' War, the person known as Bloody Mary, and the Spanish Inquisition. So the Thirty Years' War, King Ferdinand II, a Holy Roman Emperor, he wanted to force Catholic rule throughout the entire empire. His nobles that are Protestant rebel against him, and Protestant countries come to support the Protestant nobles. So it turns into a war that lasts approximately 30 years, and in the end, um, King Ferdinand, the Holy Roman Empire, the Catholics um, don't really win the war, so the Pope loses some power here. We get a Queen of England known as Bloody Mary. She's Queen Mary I. She wants to restore the Catholic faith in England. And anyone who is a Protestant, she burns them at, a, at the stake. So she tries to bring Catholicism back to England. And finally, we get the Spanish Inquisition. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel of Spain, they start a court. They do not allow any religion except Catholicism, no, no Muslims, no Jews, no Protestants. The name of the court is called the Spanish Inquisition. Um, the life of Protestants is made miserable. Uh, Muslims are um, forced out of Spain and Jews are also forced to leave Spain. All right, so you just saw my lecture on what we call the Reformation. It was a time of Reforming the Catholic Church, we get Europe split into two parts, Protestants and Catholics, and it's going to change world history. Uh, when I talk to you next, we'll be looking at European exploration. Till then, have a good day.